Thank you for joining us for another Hagley History Hangout. My name is Gregory Hargreaves, Assistant Director of the Center for the History of Business, Technology, and Society at the Hagley Museum and Library in Wilmington, Delaware. Now, you know, during these History Hangouts, we like to bring you some of the great research being done by folks who have received support from the Hagley Center in the form of research grants and fellowships of different kinds. Joining me today is historian Peter Koufax. Peter, thanks for joining me today. Well, thank you for having me. Oh, you're welcome. Let's start by painting with broad strokes. What is it you are researching and writing about? Okay, so uh, I'm a, a media historian and um, my uh, research interest is the intersection of broadcast history and uh, marketing communication. So basically, I am writing a book called Big Tobacco and American Broadcasting, which uh, traces the symbiotic relationship of the tobacco and broadcast industries. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it began in 1924 uh, with the first uh, program sponsored, national program sponsored by the, by the cigarette brand, a Lucky Strike. Uh -huh. And, and uh, in 1971, when the broadcast advertising came into effect, after that point, uh, cigarette companies or tobacco companies were not allowed to use broadcasting anymore, mm -hmm. not radio and not uh, television. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so this nearly 50-year period that you're looking at, primarily in the American market? Yeah, that's definitely the U.S. market. Um, actually, there were like six companies, uh, an oligopoly, the tobacco oligopoly, consisted of six companies. I'm dealing with five because the six of them, Brown and Williamson was owned by British, uh, by, by, by British interests. So my book is about these five US owned uh, tobacco giants who basically sold uh, a huge percentage of cigarettes in the United States, yes. Well, what role did these tobacco companies have in broadcast media? Well, that's that's like the very interesting. Um, that's an interesting question because I mean, this is my book is all about. So, it it you know the tobacco industry. I mean, I you know first of all, you anyone who is not familiar with broadcasting needs to know that, uh, or you know, no one needs to know anything. <laughs> it's uh, good to know if uh, it's good if you know that. Uh, there was a so-called single sponsorship era that is about between 1928 and uh, 1960s, mid-1960s, mm -hmm. um, where uh, non-media corporations like DuPont, for example, or tobacco companies uh, basically controlled the programs that they paid for. So the reason why it's called, was called single sponsorship is because uh, they paid the entire production cost in addition to the, in addition to the, uh, to the time charges, which is basically a distribution fee that they paid to the networks, uh, for for a, an entire season. I mean, when I'm saying the whole production cost, you know, this is like a little bit uh, um, si simplified. But basically, they were in, they were they were they paid so much money for these programs that they had control, editorial control. Mm -hmm over most of them. So basically, if there was a radio show in 1932, which, for example, was the Lucky Strike radio hour, that was prepared, uh, I mean, that was developed and produced by um, by the, the American Tobacco and, and its advertising agency, which in this case, uh, you know, was food, you know, Lord and Thomas in 1932. So basically what happened is they decided what will happen in that radio program and they decided how it will happen. And, you know, they, they hired the musicians, they hired the performers. Uh, NBC, who who distributed the show, had very little say mm -hmm. what is going to be on the program. So basically they got the script like a couple of hours or a couple of days before the, the performance. And then um, they ran it to their uh, continuity department, which was basically rubber stamped it. They just checked if there was like, you know, sex or something that, mm -hmm. you know, politically was not correct according to the, to the um, you know, the decorum of the time. 
So basically, you know, all these companies, all these non-media corporations controlled pro program content. So which meant that they were also shaped this program for their marketing communication needs. Okay, so basically they they constructed programs that were designed to sell, for example, Lucky Strike cigarettes. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, so my research is basically looking at this whole process and 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 um, putting forward the hypothesis that these companies, the tobacco companies, because they were so prevalent in in radio and television, they not only um, shaped the content and form of their own broadcast programs, but broadcasting at large. Mm -hmm. So they uh, they uh, came up with so many innovations, you know, under market pressures. You know, there was a huge competition within the tobacco industry uh, uh, within these five companies. So this competition forced them to 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 innovate and come up with new ideas. And since they were so prevalent in, in broadcasting, they practically shaped American broadcasting. So a lot of things that you see or you saw in broadcasting originated with the tobacco companies. I don't know if that makes sense. Well, it absolutely makes sense. And I'd like to break that into two pieces and first talk about how, uh, how you might tell the uh, fingerprint of tobacco was on a given um broadcast program. So what would the programming look like that has been uh, directed, as it were, by Big Tobacco? Okay, so um, okay, so let's let's say we, let's say let's say hit parade. I mean, I'm sure people still remember hit parade that was a, a radio show, uh, look strike sponsored. and then mm -hmm. after television emerged, it became also a television show. And um, so basically what happened in these shows is like, first of all, it was announced at the beginning, at the end, that this program is brought to you by Lucky Strike. Okay. And then uh, in addition to that, the only commercials on the show, you know, today we have like six, seven different brands or 10, 12 in a show. The only commercials on the show were for Lucky Strike cigarettes. So they were like, uh, in our show, there were like four, five commercials only for Lucky Strikes. So that created an exclusive association with the, between, between program and, and show. So Hit Parade was an American tobacco show. Everyone knew Hit Parade is sponsored by American Tobacco. So because of that reason, American Tobacco could use Hit Parade also outside broadcasting in a sense that they use their stars in print advertising. They used uh, uh, the program for uh, 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 public relations. So for example, if there was a dealership meeting, they brought in the, the, the Hit Parade stars mm -hmm. uh, to perform for the dealership dealers uh, uh, to perform at the dealership meeting. So basically everything that was associated with Hit Parade, the program, was associated with American Tobacco. Mm. So um, on top of that, because they controlled the script, uh, what happened is they had so-called plugs, that means mentions of Lucky Strike. Mm. And... Um, so basically, outside the, the billboard, the billboard is the beginning and the end of the show, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when they announced, you know, it's sponsored by Lucky Strike. They're, and outside the five, six commercials they had, they still had plugs for Lucky Strike. So they basically mentioned the brand uh, 30, 40 times during an hour broadcast. Wow. So, and this is just, uh, this is just the content, but also form-wise, they were able to create programs that they thought that were compatible with their brands. So when you were an, a, a market marketeer, like let's say a, a major corporation in um, in the let's say in 1940s or 30s or 50s, basically you created a program that reflected the personality of your brand. Mm. Uh, so basically, like say Dupont. Uh, always sponsored uh, very serious uh, um, programs that uh, 
that uh, helped the company's corporate identity. You know, they were they did like in, institutional advertising. Lucky Strike was a bubbly, happy-go-lucky brand. So basically, they created programs that reflected on mm -hmm. on on the brand uh, on this brand on the brand identity and. Uh, you know, in the 1930s or even already in the 1920s, American tobacco had like documents, long six, eight page documents describe what kind of music are you allowed to play on the program? Wow. How you are allowed to play on the program. So basically, American tobacco was famous for they only played the refrains of the of the choruses of the song because that's what people like. Mm. They played every song extremely fast so people can dance and uh they uh, they made um they they play the songs um they only played songs that were hits so basically every song that they played on for example the lucky strike radio hour which was the hit spread was kind of a continuation of the program um had to be known and known songs you know that the, the, the songs that made broadway you know, like that was like the slogan. So basically, they they made sure that. Um, plus, they also made sure that they played old tunes and new tunes because old hits and new hits because they were aware of the generation gap in music. Mm -hmm. So they made sure that uh, because tobacco was marketed to everyone, there was no segmentation yet. So Lucky Strikes was a cigarette that eighteen to seventy year old smoked. So basically, um, they made sure that there was something for the 70 years old and something for the 18 years old in the program. So it was an elaborate plan. And, you know, it, we just think it's funny that they sponsored it. And it's, you know, it's like an anecdote. But I mean, they had very clear marketing communication objectives, how to use a radio program. And they made sure because they controlled the editorial that, you know, they that program actually looked like how they want it to look like. Mm -hmm. Well, what that's about it? Oh yeah, that's great. What about the industry at large? How is it that perhaps tobacco in particular shaped American broadcasting as an institution, as an industry? Well, I mean, in order to, um, in order to understand this, uh, you have to look at the tobacco industry. So basically the tobacco industry uh, was an oligopoly, and you know the one one major um, characteristic of an oligopoly is that it lacks price competition. So you know there is no no price competition usually in a let's say free open market. Uh, companies compete compete uh, you know by trying to produce something good and cheap. You know, and then the the better and the cheaper it is, you know you know then they sell it obviously in, in an oligopoly that that doesn't exist if there is a is a if the price leader lowers the price everyone else lowers the price and at the end uh, you know they just basically everyone makes less money so mm -hmm. there is a there is this a tacit agreement that you know we're not going to lower the price but we need competition of course we want to have a bigger uh, portion of the pie so they compete through marketing communication which for most people means advertising because that's like the most obvious part of marketing communication so already in 19 um they already in the 1920s there were like three cigarette brands that had like 80 percent of the mm. of the of the market uh, it was lucky strikes camel and old gold which came like in the late late tennis. And then, you know, later in 33 came Philip Morris. Okay, and uh, I'm sorry, four, because Chesterfield, I, I forget Chesterfield. Chesterfield even came before hmm. Old Gold. So at the end, these five brands were dominating the American cigarette market. And they were competing, competing fiercely, but not in price, but in, hmm. in, um, in marketing communication. And which meant that whatever new things came around, they used it because they thought that's going to give them an advantage. So, for example, when, when they invented skywriting, American Tobacco was one of the first companies who used skywriting. I mean, you know, it's not very effective advertising, but, you know, that created a huge buzz. 
Mm. You know, everyone was running about, you know, planes are flying all over the major metropolitan centers in the United States and riding rocket strike in the air. And and when radio came around, you know, they pounced. I mean, American Tobacco pounced. And, you know, in 24, already the program, and in 28, American Tobacco went in full uh, full speed ahead and 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 became like the, the 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 most important client of NBC, which was the major, well, you know, the most important network at that time. And they were very successful. They uh, used radio very successfully. That forced forced the other companies to follow them in radio, and and you know they, you know, it's like tobacco became like the. The, one of the one of the the most important supporters of, of broadcasting in the United States. I mean, there were there were industry groups that they spent more on radio, but I mean they were also, but not relative to their to their to their what that they were selling. You know that that mm. it's normal that food and toiletry industries and auto industries spend a lot of money on broadcasting. But you know, tobacco actually competed with them, but you know, obviously they didn't sell as much stuff as you know like the food companies did so in relative to what they were making money wise uh they were they became like this uh ever um they were like this huge present in broadcasting and radio mm -hmm. um, and because the competition was so fierce they they innovated and they came up with new program formats they came up with new uh new um new ideas and then you know that verse was followed by the tobacco industry you know, within the tobacco industry. And then when other industries saw like how effective that was and how everyone was talking about that, you know, they they um they also begin to follow that path. And you know, that's why I'm saying is like uh uh the tobacco industry was kind of uh, um you know like um innovator uh mm -hmm. was uh, was uh, was an industry that uh, shaped broadcasting. Radio, and then of course, when television came around, you know that was like a continuation of broadcasting in many, many, many ways, and um, they had an they had a very strong position to mm. basically go into television, and and they did the same with television that they did with radio. Mm. So that's that competition what they had in within their industry that forced them to become masters you know experts in marketing communication and radio and later television became like the key key component of marketing communication would it be fair to say that uh, because of um, the involvement of big american tobacco companies in broadcast it made american broadcast both more innovative but also more closely tied to commercial purposes well, it's uh, I would say the first one for sure. Uh, the second one, I mean, someone would have done it. I mean, the American mm -hmm. broadcasting was from the get go. You know, if you look at uh, you know, for example, Hoover, who was then uh, I think a Secretary of the Interior. I mean, he was responsible for the radio, and like you look at the radio conferences in in, in the nineteen twenties. They already said that um, they are not gonna have like in the United States, not gonna have like a radio system like England or or Germany. So they are not gonna, they are not. There's not gonna be tax on the radio receivers. They are not gonna be money from the government for radio. So it had to be done. Um, they decided very early that it's gonna be like uh, financed pri privately. Mm -hmm. by private enterprise so at that moment it it became clear that uh, uh, that um, that radio will have to be uh, supported commercially and, and you know that major corporations will have will have a major role in radio well the tobacco industry did is they they learned to uh, to use this to their advantage and maybe they accelerated the development because they were so well versed in 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 in, in this field mm. but you know if there hadn't been a tobacco industry then someone else would have come around, come along mm. but mm -hmm. now what is it that you are looking at at the Hagley library in the archive collections 
Okay, so the Hagley is a, is a gold mine for, was or is uh, for my research. Um, so basically, the number one reason I came here is because Hagley acquired the, the papers of uh, BBDO, which um, is one of the major advertising agencies in the United States and has always been one of the major advertising agencies in the United States, established in 28. Today, they, I don't know, it's like a huge conglomerate. I mean, they are present in 81 countries in the world or something mm. like that. But, you know, back then it was an American agency, obviously, before globalization. And uh, what is very interesting about uh, BBDO is one is that they were one of the radio pioneers, not for American tobacco, because American tobacco was uh, somewhere else at the time. But nevertheless, they claim they established the first radio department um, and and they were very involved they had rca for example as a client i think and they had dupont as a client and uh, general electric which is which is like rca anyway um but in any case uh in 48 uh after the war bbdo acquired the american tobacco account which was a huge coup. It was like a front page in every every entertainment uh, trade magazine um, mm -hmm. because it was the, one of the largest advertising accounts in history. Uh, or not in history, but in, in in during that time, it was like, I don't know, $15 million uh, uh, a year, which is, you know, I don't know how many hundred million today money. Um, so, and you know that was the period when when television came uh, came around, and uh, you know they they were involved very quickly in television. Uh, they uh, they moved Jack Benny to television. They moved uh, Hit Parade to television. They um, they they signed. You know Robert Montgomery was an was an actor. I don't know how people remember him. A famous Hollywood actor, and he was a lucky strike and or she, and then BBDO had a contract with him to 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 for a television anthology drama. It's called Robert Montgomery Presents. Um, so they quickly moved into television, and kept radio going as long as net radio national radio networks were still relevant, which was mm -hmm. probably by the end of the. Mid fifties and yeah, mid fifties probably. So, but they had uh, the lucky strike uh, can until until 60, 67, which is huge. It was like over uh, almost two decades, I guess. And not only that, but they got also a lot of secondary American tobacco brands. They had uh, Hit Parade, as I mentioned in my little blurb that I sent you. That uh, they named a cigarette brand after the show, so that Hit Parade was so strongly associated the show so strongly associated with uh, with the uh, with american tobacco so when they came came out with a new filter brand in the 50s you know the health care um then they named it actually hit parade mm. and and the, and this brand went to uh went to american tobacco they had also teriton 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 i guess you pronounce it another brand uh that uh Lucky, uh, besides Lucky Strike, and um, you know, a couple of smaller brands that American Tobacco had, but you know, it's that it was a major, you know, that was one of the one of the mm -hmm. reasons to be okay. When but, you oh, please yeah. go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I was just going to ask when you got into the BBDNO collection, was there a certain document or set of documents that really got you excited? Uh there were several. I mean, it's uh, uh, you know, it, it's not it's not just that they had a ton, tons of stuff about American tobacco and like amazing anecdotes and uh, and uh, and scripts and and you know correspondence, which is very valuable. But uh, what is great about the BBDO collection is that it also uh, gives you an insight how a major advertising agency operated and thought. So mm -hmm. you can basically, they have all these newsletters and they have all these studies and they all that and all describing how the agency works, 
and then you can trace through time how certain priorities changed, how advertising theories changed, how the perception of broadcasting changed. So basically you can follow when you when you when you look at the BBDO material, you can uh, you can see from from the 1920s until basically 2000 how an advertising agency operated and you know you know different phases um you know the, the challenges they faced uh, you know the globalization uh, which is obviously not my current project but i mean you can see how the video expands gradually first in england and this or south america and then how it becomes like a major international play so you know it's like a behind the scene look and uh, a glance and 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 that's not that was really missing because BBDO was a, a key agency and is still a key agency. And now that this material is available to researchers, that's that's really amazing. Yeah, it's a, it is a thrill to find exactly what you need in the archives. Well, Peter, thank you so much for taking the time to share this story with me. Um, I hope you've uh, inspired folks uh, to be more interested in searching the BBDO collections as well. Okay, cool. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. And for the audience, if you would like more Hagley History Hangouts or more information on the Center for the History of Business, Technology, and Society at the Hagley Museum and Library, join us online. You can visit hagley.org. That's H-A-G-L-E-Y dot O-R-G. Don't be a stranger.